Uh, is everybody here? Everybody's, uh, everybody's here. There's an empty chair there, so... so then I will can. grab that. Grab that. There's a camera. No pressure. I will just... Uh, I'll just... Uh, <laughs> pressure. <laughs> we need a little duck that can swim yeah. under, you know? Okay, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, hi. My name is Hannes, and I have a problem. I like databases. <laughs> and now I have to say, hi, Hannes. Uh, yes. Very good. Um, we like databases. Oh, that's so great. I, I feel less awkward now. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody, to our, our humble offices. Um, we have, I don't think we've had so many people here uh, in a serious way. Um, today, we're very happy to have our friends from Tiger Beetle and more friends from Tiger Beetle, which are transitive friends, but therefore are also from our friends, <laughs> um, here to talk about databases and assorted uh, topics. And um, with, yeah. Love to kick it off with Joran, who is uh, going to be the first speaker. Yeah, great. Yeah. I thought we saved the best for last. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thanks for having us, uh, Hannes, Mark, and DuckDB friends. And um, it's, we're really proud to be part of the, the uh, Animal Database Alliance. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I met Hannes in London at QCon, and we were chatting about this idea that. Um, DuckDB also do boat cruises, so we said, well, we'll, we'll come for a boat cruise. <laughs> and uh, fantastic to learn about what you're doing in analytics and vectorization. And also just to say thanks to some of our friends who actually just booked flights from Brazil, from Switzerland, from Italy, um, also just to come and uh, attend because they like DuckDB so much. Uh, so really great to be here. And also to share from our side uh, some things in the OLTP world. And um, yeah, but just great to come all the way to Netherlands and, and be here again uh, and, and give you, uh, so I'm going to give you an overview of Tiger Beetle and um, the reason for existence for Tiger Beetle is that things are changing. Uh, the world is becoming more transactional. So I got stuck on the plane in Frankfurt. Um, a lot of things happened and I won't tell you the story. Long and the short of it was I eventually took a train from Frankfurt to Amsterdam. And on the train, I watched Michael Stonebreaker saying that everything you know is wrong. And he was saying this 10 years ago, and he was saying, well, in OLTP, it's now two orders of magnitude more performance. So you know, everything you know is wrong. And I thought, wow, that's interesting because it seems to have happened again, you know, that the world is becoming more transactional. So for example, like servers, it used to be that you would buy a, a physical server and you would rent space and power and you would stick it in a colocation rack. Um, then that changed so you could rent a server by the month uh, instead of buying a server you could rent it um, So where before you would have one transaction to buy it now you would have a transaction every month um, And then it became even more transactional so you could now um, Rent a server by the hour so where you would pay once a month suddenly um, Now you have had 500 transactions per month, you know for your, your hourly billing um, and then it became even more transactional now you could you know, pay by the minute, and suddenly now you've got serverless, like per second billing. So the server world has become very much transactional, three orders of magnitude. And then the things that we all love, like music and movies, it's the same thing. So you used to buy the white album, then you could buy the songs, 99 cents, it seems like a long time ago. Now you just stream, like you stream, and, and we don't even know how that those transactions get worked out, but it's maybe per second. So it's again, very transactional. Um, and you know from album to song is at least one order of magnitude and then into streaming even more and then the same thing happens for movies um, you could buy a movie rent a movie now you stream uh, and then again for cars you would you know you, you you would work your whole life and you would buy your car maybe it might, maybe you buy two cars in your whole lifetime and then you start to rent cars and then you start to rent your driver for your trip um, and now maybe instead of having one or two transactions in a 70 year window, you now have like, uh, we've had quite a few Uber trips even today. Uh, so cars, and then finally you get like energy. And this was something I didn't realize before Tiger Beetle. Um, but the world has in the last few years, even since that Stonebreaker talk, the world of energy has become drastically more transactional because um, our energy sources have changed. So as you move to clean energy, um, that requires you to be transactional. You have to be flexible. You have to adapt. 
what is the sun doing? Is it cloudy right now? Is it rainy in Amsterdam right now? Is, are we, is it really summer here? Uh, and this changes the dynamics of how you do energy. So in the old world, the, the person would come, I don't know if it's like this here, but in South Africa or in, in the UK, someone would come to your house and check the meter reading once a month. And then they would do a transaction and you would get your bill and you would pay for your electricity usage. And now in the world of clean energy, the government has even said, well, in many countries, have said, well, it's, it's no longer allowed to do once a month because that's not clean. We need to be more flexible. We need to start settling electricity prices every 30 minutes. And we, we will mandate this in law. So all of a sudden, your, your volume of transactions in energy has gone up by 1,440 times. It's just three orders of magnitude, just like that. Um, and then finally, so this is the world that I first got a touch of the, the test of these things is payments. And the payments world used to be also where you send someone a payment and it takes three days. Now it's instant. And also the amount, the, the size of the payments, you know, before you would never dream of sending someone less than $5 because if you did, all of it would go to, you know, currency conversion fees. And so you, it didn't make sense to do micropayments. But now the world of payments is changing so that if you want to do a $5 transaction, you can actually do that at the level of cents. And, and suddenly you've, one transaction becomes 500 transactions. So again, close to three orders of magnitude more transactional. And, um, and whenever you face an order of magnitude change, you know, Jeff Dean's wisdom from Google, he would say, well, new order of magnitude implies new designs. And so in the world of OLTP, perhaps at least across these sectors, it's three orders of, three orders of magnitude increase in volume. Um, and then we have some design problems be, which are starting to be surfaced. So firstly is that um, OLTP perhaps has an impedance mismatch. Um, what do I mean? So actually SQL is not the language of business. Uh, accounting is the language of business. It always has been. You know? So we would never dream to replace SQL. It's, it's a very good enough uh, query language. But unfortunately, when it comes to you know, how things have been done for hundreds of thousands of years. This has stood the test of time, you know, double entry accounting primitives, how you can model any kind of business across all these sectors. It all comes down to double entry accounting transactions, uh, which is where you get OLTP transactions processing. But actually, the way these happen in the real world as business events, if you book an Airbnb, if you book an Uber ride, there's little double entry transactions that happen. Um, and that's the best schema for modeling businesses, business events, is double entry accounting. Um, and unfortunately, SQL is the language of OLTP. So you've got this impedance mismatch where what you're really trying to do is track transactions in the business world, real business events, and you do it using this language SQL. Um, and what that means then is that you see, this is what we saw, um, people would take a generic, it's, a generic like um, MySQL or Postgres database and they would fix the impedance mismatch problem by wrapping it with 10,000 lines of code just to implement double entry counting primitives. Uh, and everybody was doing this and, and, and we saw this and we thought, well, okay, that's interesting because you see the same thing happening again and again and again. Um, and so what, what would happen when we actually looked at a, a specific payment switch, which is how I came at this problem, um, a payment switch is just a way where there's a few banks and the one bank says, okay, I want to pay you this much. They say, I'll pay you this much. And you just keep track of I O U, And then every now and then the gold moves at the central bank. But so there's clearing and then you've got the settlement where the gold moves. But for each transaction between these parties, um, one payment is 20 physical SQL queries because of this impedance mismatch. And you might think, well, I, can, I know how to do this better. But like really, when you look at these systems to do this double entry, um, and this is really all they're doing, debit the bank account for a very small amount. That's a clue to volume increasing. Credit the customer account. This is all you're trying to do. And to really do this with idempotency and solve all the problems, it's like 20 SQL queries. Um, the other insight is that people just say, sure, we're going to solve scaling with horizontal sharding. But really, you have to think of the workload. So as you drill deep into the problem, it's not just that you lack the primitives, that there's impedance mismatch, 
but that the workload is actually very interesting. So we need to look at the workload also and see, well, you know, here we've got one financial transaction for 20 physical queries, but let's go back to that transaction. Here we've got a million accounts, fine, that's good for horizontal um, scalability. You just shard on your customer account, right? Can you see the problem? What's always going to be debited? There's one bank account. There's one bank account. And all of these shards are going to be serialized by the performance of the shard. But yeah, um, and th this affects sort of single node database where you've got write blocks per bank account. Um, but uh, so you've got the row locks. And then it actually gets worse with the distributed database that's horizontally scaled because they just bet on the speed of light and fiber, which seems great, which is great for bandwidth, but not for latency because this is constant. It's not going to improve. And I don't know what Moore's Law is doing these days, but it's pretty good. Um, and what we've done, what, what the current systems force you to do now is, as you're trying to process these transactions, you're serializing everything on the bank account, and you've got to keep fetching that across shards because we partition too early. Um, so that's the other problem. And when you put this all together, you've got your like your lawnmower engine, and you build your car around it, and you end up with your financial system of record. And your, your raw material of the database could do like a million transactions a second, but the physical, you know, the finished product afterwards, this is what we saw, could do 76 transactions a second. And this was with, you know, thousands of dollars of, of uh, microservice cloud hardware, um, 76 transactions a second. So the other problem is that financial transactions obviously are, you've, you can't lose people's money. And... And then, you know, a lot of these OLTP systems were designed 30 years ago, at least two of them, 30 years. Uh, and since then, there's actually been a lot of research. So, especially from here. Um, and what they've shown is that existing database designs actually imperil durability. So it's not just that they weren't designed to handle corruption of the disk, but if you can give just a single disk sector fault, you know, disk sectors do fail, you know, half a percent probability in a two-year period for one disk and you run clusters of these and your probabilities go up you know you have 10 disks 10x the probability um, so it's not just that they can't handle it but when you put the sector fault in they actually make it worse so they go they panic and they just destroy your data also and all you did was you put in one disk sector fault and postgres did the rest so like <laughs> okay postgres i'll give you i'll give you fsync gate and Postgres says, I see your F-Sync gate, and I'm just going to, um, I'm, yeah, I'm going to cause real, you know, data loss that Craig Gringer is going to discover. And it's actually where the existing designs just accelerate the fault. So it's not just that they can't handle it, but they make it worse. For example, what you could do is if you see the fault of F-Sync gate, you could just shut down and not make it worse. But they don't, the problem is they actually make it worse. Um, so this was this paper, and two years later, they found that the fix for FSync gate actually wasn't correct. So the only fix for FSync gate is to use direct IO, which Postgres is busy merging now, and obviously that's a whole lot of work. Um, so kind of the test for FSync gate, does your database handle it? Well, is it using direct IO to recover the log at startup? Um, because if it isn't, obviously FSync gate was all about the kernel page cache not being coherent with the disk if the disk fails. Um, and so the only way to really fix that is when you recover your log at startup, you have to use direct IO to see what is actually on the disk. Otherwise, what you end up doing is you externalize decisions that your database has made on the log at startup, but you're actually reading from the kernel page cache, which isn't durable. So you're externalizing commitments <coughs> about transactions on something that only exists in the kernel, kernel page cache, not what's actually on disk. So, Again, the fix for this, if you want a like, quick litmus test, is a database doing this properly? Is it using direct IO? Um, but then it gets worse. So this was also 2018, same year as FSync gate. And this showed that if you have a nice distributed um, database that will survive you know, nuclear war, um, because there, there are some creatures that do, um, then, but if you can put like a single sector fault just on one machine, just inject that, into the log of one machine, and that's it. So you've got a, you've got, you've got redundancy, um, multiple machines, and you're going to inject one fault on one machine in the cluster. They found that that single sector fault will 
propagate through the raft or Paxos consensus protocol, resulting in global cluster data loss. Um, so, and th the reason this happens is because what the write ahead log will do of one of these replica machines is it will see the corrupt sector that you've injected and it will think that that means that that machine failed to shut down properly after power loss. So it will see the checksum failure and say, okay, here I'm, I'm in the log and I see here in the log, this checksum is broken, it's faulty, the sector is faulty. Ah, that must mean that I had power loss as a database, I shut down and, I, and there was a torn write. I didn't finish writing what I, was, what I was trying to write. So therefore, after power comes back on, you restore from the log, you see this, and they go, okay, that was because of power loss. I'm gonna truncate the log from that point onwards. I'm going to actually go and delete everything in the right ahead log. I will delete it all because it must have been power loss. But actually, um, there's another possibility, another explanation, which is not power loss, but just bit rot. So that, that log, somewhere in the middle of that committed log, um, it was committed and acknowledged to the user as committed. And then subsequently that disk just had a sector fault, which corrupted the middle of the, of the snake. Um, and you can see the problem that, you know, after restarting the database conflates these two events of um, bit rot and power loss and truncates the committed log. And obviously, if you truncate the committed log in a consensus system, you're undermining the quorum votes that happened. So what can happen now is your cluster can enter split brain. And once you enter split brain, your Paxos formal proof is no longer valid and your raft formal proof is no longer valid. And you can get into global cluster data loss. So this was the paper on this. It won best paper at FAST um, 2018. And a lot of great ideas in here, so I'll leave it to you to go and dig in and read it slowly and read it again the second and third time. Um, but what this paper was really motivating is that how you solve these problems, you have to think, rethink the design of the database. Um, so you have to integrate your global consensus protocol with your local storage engine. So how you recover from faults locally, it makes sense that if you see something is corrupt, try and fix that by asking the global cluster what do you think? Is this in my committed log or is it still being committed? And then you can start to make proper decisions on how you handle disk sector faults, but you can't handle them only in the context of your local replica. You have to ask the cluster, is it safe for me to truncate this? And sometimes you really do want to truncate because if you don't, your cluster becomes unavailable prematurely. So it's like a double-edged sword. You know, how do, we, how do we maximize durability we have? How do we remain available? and correct, and you've got to do both. So that's protocol aware recovery. And then we still haven't spoken about high availability, you know, single node, MySQL or Postgres, you can't really use that for financial transactions. It's not, it, it's not high, it doesn't give you high availability out of the box, and it doesn't give you gray failure tolerance. You know, what do you do if hardware fails, becomes slow? It's the slow failures that kill things. Um, so you really need these systems to handle this. And we thought, well, Let's look at all of this, you know, safety, performance, and operating experience. And from first principles, let's see, well, what do we actually need today to process transactions? And we realized, well, okay, firstly, transactions are double entry. There's an account you debit, credit, 128-bit um, identifier. Um, you've got an amount, and it's like two cash lines. Um, the account has got a debit credit balance, a little bit of meter data also, and it's again, 128 bytes. Um, and that's it. That's all that the world of business needs for the last thousand years. And we thought, well, let's just give them that. And, you know, databases will always say, you know, consistency is where Alice pays Bob and you don't want to count money twice. And then you look at the docs and you say, well, where are the double entry accounting primitives? And you, the database was promising you this with consistency, but actually they're giving you raw data consistency. They're not giving you financial consistency. So we thought, let's give financial consistency for the domain and, and let the database expose these first-class primitives. Because then if you do that, you can move the code to the data. So those 20 SQL queries can become, you know, one, one database query because your, the logic or the business logic for how you update account balances can be co-located with the data. Um, so now you've gone from 20 to one. So you've just improved performance 20 times. And we thought, well, can we do better? Like, you know, you can execute now one financial transaction in one 
uh, database query because you fix the impedance mismatch, you're speaking the language of financial accounting, can we do better? Because that's only order of magnitude and Stonebreaker was saying, well, we're already two orders of magnitude. Uh, and we've actually got to catch up now also since then, three orders of magnitude. So you, you can do this if you realize that, look, transfers between accounts are 128 bytes. So you can pack 8,191 of them plus 128 bytes for a header in a one meg message. And you can switch that message through the replication protocol, through the state machine. Um, and each time, you know, in one database query, you're doing 10,000 transactions, you know, on the order of 10,000. So now you're doing one database query and you've executed 10,000. And there you've got your three orders of magnitude plus another magnitude just for final to be safe or give you headroom, you know. Um, so first class batching API. Um, and then we did a few other things in Tiger Beetle like let's get rid of syscalls, um, use IOU ring, let's get rid of memory copies because memory bandwidth in the database is more and more important, especially as the IO gets so fast. Let's do cache line aligned fixed size structs because hey, we need two cache lines, two cache lines. So we just, it's so simple, but you can um, get some nice wins. Um, the big insight also is that when we looked at this problem, we realized like I, I was working on hash tables at the time. And I knew that if you've got a very fast hash table like Swiss table or F14, you can do on the order of like 10 million hash table operations a second. And I thought, why is this system doing 76 a second when an in-memory hash table can do 10 million? And I thought, okay, let's drop, like divide by 10 for all the other costs and surely we can do a million a second, right? And, and so it turns out you can. So it's called a state machine and this is just a function. You've got the old state of the account balances and then you bring in like 10,000 transfers, which do a whole lot of hash table operations and then you get the, the new state. Um, and that's pretty fast. Uh, so this was kind of how we got thinking on Tiger Beetle, just this idea that function with a state plus input new state, and it's, we're thinking of it like a hash table. Um, and then, well, how do you solve the problem of durability? So, okay, before we run it through the hash table, we're gonna write it in a, a write ahead log for durability, um, fsync. And here's like the log, like a circular buffer on disk, one operation, two operation, three operation. And then you run these through the state machine. So you get state is one, state is three, state is six. And that's the big idea, durability plus performance. Um, and we did a prototype of this um, in JavaScript even in five hours. And this was the result, you know, 400,000 transactions a second. And this prototype was measuring all the costs, you know, cryptographic checksumming, everything. And, and then we saw, okay, wow, you know, this is goosebumps because we can do something here. And that became Tiger Beetle. And what we realized is it's not enough to say we're as safe as Postgres or MySQL because people will be, well, I still don't trust you. <laughs> so we thought, okay, let's just go to the moon and back. So we took NASA's 10 rules for safety critical code um, and we just adopted them because they actually, I, I had experience with them before. They help you to build systems so you sleep well at night. So lots of assertions everywhere. Uh, limits on everything. You don't have while true loops anymore. Even your loops have limits. You encode how long you expect a loop to run. And static memory allocation. So all the memory in Tiger Beetle, you know, you start Tiger Beetle and then you look at your memory usage and then you watch your transactions go up to like a few hundred thousand a second. And you look at your memory usage again and it, it, it doesn't change. <laughs> it's just like this, you know. So it's very easy to operate because it's like Tetris with square boxes. All the boxes are square. And so it, all the resources we use, you know, there's limits on everything and it's like a forcing function for the design. And then all these nice things come, come out of that, it can be consistent after a crash. Um, but we wanted to do an explicit storage fault model using the, the newest research from Wisconsin Madison. Whereas, you know, disks can become like the network, they can become, a sector can be temporarily partitioned so you can't read from it and then later you can. That can do very interesting things, you know, if you're trying to, figure out what is the state on disk. And sometimes you can read a sector and sometimes you can't. How do you make good decisions there? It's very tricky. Corruption we've spoken about. Misdirected IO is where you tell the kernel, please write to this sector and it says, okay. And it, it writes to your DuckDB file or somewhere else, you know, or please read from this sector and it reads from the wrong place. Perhaps that also has a valid checksum. So you have to do stuff that is protocol aware to handle all these faults. Um, 
And then finally, like durability is a big one, but it's not enough to just have a write ahead log on one machine. You need to, before you acknowledge financial transactions, you need to make sure it's across multiple machines before you act, um, which is also a good thing because you get high availability um, and it's pretty optimal. So you just write to your leader's disk plus one other copy and then you can act. And that, I mean, you have to do that backup anyway, um, but really this is view stamp replication, which is a consensus protocol. Um, Brian Oakey, Barbara Liskov, James Cowling. It's actually, um, this is the original consensus protocol. It beat Lamport by a year. Um, this was the first one, then Paxos a year later. And actually, if you read the ViewStamp Revisited paper, it's very similar to the Raft paper, which came two years later. And I find this one is even more understandable. And the protocols are virtually identical. Um, so we use ViewStamp replication. And I've, ta I've spoken so far, you know, we've got this big in-memory hash table stuff going on, got a log, um, and then we've got a storage engine. Um, because the story, it's not enough to just snapshot your state to disk like Redis does, because you've got a lot of transactions and snapshotting to disk could take like 15 minutes, um, you know, every time you want to dump that to disk. So we don't do, we don't just snapshot it to disk, rather, we've got all this in-memory state, and here's the problem. How do you get the state to disk incrementally, even as you're processing transactions? Um, and I'm gonna show you a picture, and I think you'll guess what I'm showing you. You've got transactions coming into the log, you execute these, they fill up the in-memory buffer, that gets full, you write it to disk, and you say, well, this covers these range of keys, A to B, which are sorted, another sorted table, another sorted table, there's your key ranges. You have a little bit of a manifest in memory to tell you what tables you've got on disk. Anyone guess the structure? Log structured merge tree. Um, so this is actually ideal for how do you get, you know, in memory changes that spill out of memory, get them to disk. This is a really nice structure for that. Um, I love this quote, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, the second best time is now. We, we, were, we took the second best option. Uh, uh, and the reason is, well, obviously we've got a storage fault model, existing LSMs don't. Um, they don't really recover from misdirected uh, reads and writes, things like that. Um, we also wanted the NASA safety standard. They don't follow that. They don't do static allocation. They're not memory efficient. Um, this is the third big reason is that we started to see signs from different people, view stamp replication, protocol aware recovery, what foundation DB were doing. and. All three wise, wise people were pointing to this future that is deterministic. Um, so we actually built Tiger Beetle not as a distributed database, but as a deterministic distributed database. So all the abstractions in Tiger Beetle where there's a source of non-determinism like time or thread scheduling or how you do IO to disk or networking events, all of that is carefully abstracted um, so that we can run this whole system deterministically given the same inputs of network or time, you always get to the same result. So Foundation DB wrote their database like this and Tiger Beetle did as well. But we had to write the whole thing to be deterministic, even how we use hash, you know, hash tables. If we upgrade standard libraries as the hash table, what, what are we depending on for determinism? Um, and the reason we did this is so that we could then run everything in a deterministic simulation. So we could now shim run this whole distributed database um, and we could inject network storage faults because we believe in storage faults so we now test the code and, and really do a lot of it um, and then if we find any bugs well we can replay the bugs and we've got a little seed so we find a bug with our simulator and then we drop this bug in our slack channel and suddenly the whole team with this number they take this number put it into the simulator in their CLI in their terminal and we're all reproducing the exact same bug. The whole universe of, of chaos injection is all exploded out of this little seed. And so straight away, this is how you solve, you know, how do you build a new database where the others took 30 years? Um, well, you can, because in the simulated world, you can speed up time. So because you control the passing of time deterministically, you just speed that thing in a while true loop. So 3.3 seconds as you run the simulator on your laptop, is giving you 39 minutes of test time. So if you found a bug that took 39 minutes in the real world to hit, you can do printf debugging. It's now possible to do printf debugging. 
because you only have to do 3.3 seconds and you've you've got that 40 minute bug and now so 10 seconds gives you three printfs that you can use um, and whereas normally you know you'd have to wait 40 minutes for your test to run now you you wait much less a day is two years of testing so we run like 10 of these simulators on 10 cores 24 7 so every day it's like 20 years 20 and tiger beetle gets old fast uh, and the simulator is called the VOPA, View Stamped Operation Replicator. Um, these are some of the faults, all different kinds of partitions in the network, storage latencies, um, corruption probabilities. And what we actually went and did was we said, well, let's let people see the simulator. Um, so we compiled the whole uh, Tiger Beetle database running in the browser with WASM. Um, so you can actually see like the real thing. And um, we're coming into land now. This is our simulator, but I actually thought, let me show it to you. Um, and this will be law of demos. Let's do here. Oh, so it is alive. Yeah. And now what you're going to do see is like real tiger beetle code. And we've got a whole cluster of beetles in the browser. First scenario, there's no network faults. Everything is perfect. Oh, we have sound. Great. Um, and these are real tiger beetles. Each of them runs real tiger beetle code. And the cluster is busy starting up. And this is all derived from the seed. Five replicas, three clients at top. And they're going to start sending in and replicating and hacking back. See the network is fine, storage is fine. And by the way, Fabio over there is the is the game developer who did all this. So. And I think we'll we'll just stop there, right? We went, but this was hard enough. Just everything perfect. Should we leave it? To okay. So this is now Red Desert. That's Andy Pavlo doing his bathtub lecture <laughs> and, um, this is now more difficult so we've got network partitions falling from the sky and we've got um, packet loss of 13 percent all packets will get dropped uh, packets get replayed partitioned um, no storage faults but you can see we're doing view changes to elect a new leader um, what is cool too is you can actually like partition the leader and then the cluster will elect a new <laughs> okay so let me crash that one again this is my favorite um... <laughs> and you can see view stamp replication is electing a new um, primary each time and that's it so this last one is normally what databases don't do. So this is where you now have disk faults. Um, and then we'll, this is kind of going to show you what happens if you have disk corruption with Tiger Beetle storage fault model. And um, this is a hard, hard scenario. You know what? That duck is very resilient uh, in the radioactive slime. But now we've got eight percent of reads to disk are being corrupt, and nine percent of writes are being corrupt, uh, and we're going to see if the if the beetles survive. <laughs> and I wonder what will happen like, if I can find my mask. Ah, so. oh, there we go. If I click that duck, what do you think will happen? <laughs> <laughs> so now we've been upgraded where you can crash a, a beetle with a duck. <laughs> a tiger beetle can handle that. Uh, it's something it was, it was built to survive, it's duck mode. Beatles as well.
And the simulator is testing everything, you know, for strict serializability. We, we even have checks that will check for like cache coherency, the if and get. So the simulator is constantly checking the in-memory caches of each replica. Does it match what the simulator knows is on disk? Um, here's Fabio sitting over there. And this is like the game within a game. So please let us know. <laughs> This is the highest of 73, but Hannes, you're in here too. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm in the list. Yeah, you, you one of the names. Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> Thanks everyone, uh, that's overview of Tiger Relay.